This has been and still continues to be a busy day. Very, very fascinating, though. Uh, thank you all for bearing with us. Uh, uh, I apologize. We have to rush forward. We have a very set deadline at 6.30. Uh, people are going various places, and we still have uh, two sessions and a summary before that. So uh, moving on, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Mikhail Karayani. Uh, a professor of law at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, also the Bruce uh, Wayne, Bruce Wayne, that's cool, uh, chair in international law. It's Batman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Batman chair in law. Uh, Karayani was the academic director of the Minerva Center for Human Rights, vice dean of the faculty in law, the director of the Harry Michael Shar Shah Institute for uh, uh, Research and Comparative Law. Um, a winner of various scholarships and fellowships like Fulbright, Rothschild, uh, Maoff, and uh, many others. Uh, his research interests are private international law, conflict of law, civil, civil procedure, multiculturalism. Among his publications are Conflicts in, in a Conflict, a Conflict of Law Studies on Israel and the Palestinian Territories, and Forum on Convenience in the Modern Age, a Comparative and Methodological Analysis of Anglo-American Law. Please, and I'm going to keep time. Okay. How, how much time? Uh, 20 minutes? More than 15 to 20 minutes. <laughs> so I've, I've circulated the, the paper. You probably have uh, maybe read it or not. I'll, I'll just go through the basic arguments I, I will be making or I made in the paper. But before that, I would like to put the paper in a context because it's actually about context. Uh, <clears throat> dealing with multiculturalism, th there's a very um, known article by Susan Muller Hawking, speaking of Stanford. Is multiculturalism bad for women? And she really criticizes this tendency to accommodate groups. And that piece is full of examples whereby groups treat their individuals very badly. And th that's, that's the whole paper. And she, she goes over various examples of immigrants and indigenous uh, minorities, uh, from honor killing to uh, coerced marriage, uh, and so on and so on. And one take on Susan Marrow-Hawken was that <clears throat> this is too blunt. It, it essentializes culture. When you speak of these immigrants, you're like saying, well, all of the Muslims are the same. All of um, these uh, various indigenous minorities are just the same. These are their acts. And therefore, we should question whether this, these groups should be accommodated or not. And that's why she has this question mark uh, uh, w w in the title of, of her paper. And the take from on that paper is that, well, you should look at culture more closely. And culture can be as much about group practices. There are individuals when you kind of highlight the reality within the culture, you can see how culture can vary within and you would have different types of practices. And this practice might be acceptable. I have one take about honor killing. Well, why if you have Ten cases of honor killings in Israel, which is too much. One case is too much. But you might have about thousands of other cases where nothing happens in terms of the individual in the family. Why does that not count for culture and only the few cases do? And how do you take uh, and, and a certain practice qualifies as a cultural practice? What is your standard? What is your qualification standard. And so I've played much with how we conceive of society as a set of individuals, or individuals as such, and communities. And the take is that when, when, you, when we look at communities and we judge society by the communities, this is too blunt, too essential. The argument I'm making in this article is kind of to balance that off and say that 
there are certain realities we cannot understand without understanding the dynamics of communities as such, irrespective of the individual liberal outlook into society. And I do that by presenting two cases, uh, Israeli Supreme Court cases, where the narrative, where the discourse, where the judgment is very much about liberal ideals, looking at the individual, uh, looking at neutrality as central in terms of the judicial outlook. And what I do in, in, in the article is that I, I show that this does not make any sense. I mean, the arguments put forward by the Israeli Supreme Court, when they are de deconstructed, they, they do not convince, they're not convincing, even by liberal terms. And in order to make sense of the result, it is essential to put the groups concerned in context and relate to the groups that are involved. And only then can we make any logic of the resolution that is uh, that, that that court reaches. Now, what I will be doing is I wouldn't be necessarily saying that this is my own personal view, uh, but I think you cannot reason this 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 result without relating to the communities concerned. And I would go through these two cases. So one is Muna Jabarin. Uh, <clears throat> it's a Muslim uh, student from Umm al Fahim who sought admission to a Catholic school in Nazareth. And when she showed up for the enrichment courses after being admitted, she showed up with a headscarf. And the school said, Well, you cannot enter our school unless you would take off the headscarf. And then the student said, well, it's not just my headscarf that you would need to respect. I'm not willing to take part in swimming classes with boys. And if I would come to regular physical education classes, I would want to come in a special uh, uniform. <laughs> and you should accommodate all of these uh, besides the headscarf. And the school said, no. And then she petitioned the Israeli Supreme Court saying that what the school did is, is uh, an infringement on her freedom of conscience and freedom of religion since she is discriminated against, excluded from the school because of her Muslim identity. And that petition was denied. Aaron Barak was the presiding justice and he, he wrote the main decision and he said a couple of things. One is that the school being diverse in terms of its school, uh, its uh, student population, it has an interest in uniformity. It, it is in the name of pluralism, and he, 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 he mentions pluralism explicitly, that the school would have this policy of having one uniform for all and this is something that the student should respect. The other thing he said is that this school is private. It is not public. And being private, since it belongs to the Catholic community, which is a recognized community, then it can even restrict admission only to Catholics. And if it opens it up, then she or that the school is, is, is free. To, to model that restriction as, as it sees fit. And, and, and therefore, it has this leeway as a private institution to restrict uh, admission. Now, these two arguments, for me, did not make any sense. Pluralism is about respecting difference. It's not about imposing uniformity. Uh, I mean, that, that's what... Plural, pluralism is about. We don't need even pluralism to impose that we all should be the same. It, you can have other powerful theories, but if pluralism is, is meaningful, it is about justifying why you can stay as you are and still be part of the community. But what the court have done here is that if you are to be admitted in the name of pluralism, you should comport 
with what the school is, is, is saying or what the school is conditioning. And, and this, this on its face did not make any sense to me. Secondly, how do you characterize a school as being private instead of public? Now, this Catholic school receives about 70 to 80 percent of its budget from the government. It's characterized as an Mukar Lorishmi, recognized but unofficial. And as such, the bulk of its uh, budget is, is, is coming from the government. And how can you characterize it as, as being private? It's mostly public, actually. But then again, I mean, who would have a more, more interest in uniformity, uh, a public school or a private school? I think a public school would have. But then Barack is saying, if Mona Jabarin would have sought admission <coughs> to a public school, then he would have ruled exactly the opposite. But then a public school might be more interested in uniformity. Why is it then that the school uh, uh, would not be uh, permitted? So it's, it's, it doesn't make uh, much sense. And the third thing that really got me started with Muna Jabarin, this case has not received any scholarly attention in Israel. But it's dynamite stuff. I mean, it's the Israeli Supreme Court restricting the Muslim headscarf in an Israeli school. No scholarly attention at all when the issue of the headscarf in schools in France, in Germany, right? It is, it is, it is taking the attention of, of, of many scholars and a lot of work has been published. But in Israel, I only found two articles that incidentally dealt with the Mona Jabarin case. And no criticism, no discussion, and the discussion even within the Arab-Palestinian community inside of Israel was minimal uh, about this, this, this issue. And it wasn't the only issue. It wasn't the only case. It was preceded or followed by two cases in, in Akko, it's a Terra Santa school, also a Christian school that denied admission to two Muslim students with the headscarf. And you had a case in the Schmidt school here in, in, in East Jerusalem where the same act was denied um, or a teacher was, was fired or conditioned upon being uh, employed uh, with her taking off the headscarf after she had taken on the headscarf. Nothing. So that, that was puzzling. Uh, that, that was puzzling for me. Why is this so much absent uh, from the scholarly discussion when it's so much present in, in, in many other places? And there was something disingenuous in terms of, of even the argument being made by the school. It's a Catholic school. And anybody who's acquainted with the school knows very well that the headmaster is a Catholic priest. Right? And the Catholic priest will come to school with uh, the, the collar and with the Catholic robe. It's a school where there can be nuns, and the nuns would come with their uh, uh, robe. And it was, it held mass every once in a while, on a Sunday, that's for sure. On Christian the days of holidays, it would hold mass. How can we speak of uniformity? And uh, when, if anything is, is possible, it's only Christian. It, it's that uniformity. And when uniformity was imposed, at least in that German, in Bavaria, it was overturned, that decision, just about, I think, six months ago. The first that were called to abide by uniformity were the teachers, not the students. And it was a Muslim teacher who was asked to take off her headscarf. So it first begins with uh, administration, not with the student body. But in Muna Jabarin, it was the opposite. The students were not allowed, but in terms of the administration, they were. So it didn't make a lot of sense, or for me, it, was, it, it, it made a lot of nonsense. 
But then I tried to say, well, is there something that can still hold this decision? And it's not just this Catholic school. There are 72 Christian schools operating in Israel. And 90 or 95% of these schools would have bylaws saying you cannot come to school with any wardrobe that I do not prescribe, meaning that you cannot come to school with the headscarf. And then I began seeing also Noar Kehalakha, the Emmanuel case. And Emmanuel, for those of you who do not know, the settlement, it's a settlement in the occupied West Bank. It's, it's a settlement of ultra-Orthodox individuals. Mostly it was from Ashkenazi with a small Sephardi ultra-Orthodox. Hazrim Bichuva, uh, Jews that became religious, have began uh, coming into Emmanuel. This has disrupted the peace inside of the community, and this community that was coming into Emmanuel was mostly Sephardi. And the school decided to split itself, two sections. As the, the statistics have shown, uh, one section was predominantly Ashkenazi, 73% Ashkenazi, the rest Sephardi, and in the old section it was a mirror image, exactly uh, the opposite. And the, the parents of, of a Sephardi students said what the Ashkenazi school did, separating itself, is illegal and discriminatory. And it petitioned the Israeli Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court was receptive. It said this cannot stand. This is discrimination. What was interesting is that the court uh, based its, its judgment on the statistical evidence. It didn't find any direct evidence that because you are Sephardi, you're not to be admitted to the Ashkenazi section. It based its decision on the statistical evidence. And, a, and, a, and a, an investigator said explicitly, if a Sephardi student would have accepted the bylaws of the Ashkenazi school section, then that student would have been admitted. And therefore, it was about religiosity instead of ethnicity. And that was his conclusion. But the court said no. And it cited Brown, separate, cannot be equal. Right? And, and I, I began to laugh when everybody in Israel was really very happy about the decision. The decision was welcomed across the board. Uh, but it was, for me, such a double standard, apologetic kind of a decision. First of all, if you look at the statistics, why is it that you're so much against the separation when all of the educational system in Israel is separated? I mean, Arabs and Jews go to different schools. Within the Jewish community, it's the public, the public religious, the ultra-Orthodox. About the ethnicity? I mean, what, what is the Ma'ayana Hinukha Turani? What is Shas about? I mean, it's started as having an independent school system. And it has its own st school system. Why, when that happened, there was no uproar? But when this small Ashkenazi community wanted to separate itself, Brown, separate, cannot be equal when everything in Israel in terms of education is, is about separateness. And then I looked at the bylaws of the Ashkenazi section. The bylaws that these Sephardi students needed to accept in order to be admitted to the Ashkenazi section says that these students cannot connect to the internet. These uh, girl students cannot ride on the bicycle. Uh, they cannot listen to the radio. They cannot see movies. They cannot uh, go to hotels or to recreational parks. Uh, and, and they cannot be hosted at the homes of people who do not observe the, the Jewish um, obligations 
and, and mitzvot uh, generally. And you're defending their incorporation in that school on, 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 on liberalism? This is crazy. I mean, you want to have these girl students be admitted and take part in this school system, and, and you're defending that on the basis of liberalism. Is this what Brown was about? I mean, if Brown, it's like Brown saying, well, blacks and whites should go to the same school, but you know what, Hispanics, Jews, and all of the other communities should stay in their separate schools. Is this what Brown about? I think the paradigm is, is something like Goel Ratzon, okay? Goel Ratzon was a, had a cult, okay? It's like in Waco, Texas. What was the guy called in, in Waco, Texas that had this cult? Yeah. And Goel Ratzon had, I don't know, tens of women as his wives, okay? And let's suppose that Goel Ratzon do not admit or would not admit any Arab women. He's only a <laughs> Jewish woman. Okay? Quraysh is not willing to admit any black woman. And a black woman comes in, or an Arab woman comes in, no, I seek to be admitted because I want to be treated equally with other women. Would liberalism defend such a right? This is crazy, but this is exactly what the Supreme Court was doing here. Do you want to subordinate all of these girl students to these norms? Is this something that liberalism is... is, 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 is is the Well, on that basis, the Sephardic schools. Well, they're, they're less conservative in, ter in terms of the religious. But nonetheless, would liberalism be, 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 be something that would justify? And I think not. And, I, and once again, this does not make sense. If any of these two cases would make any sense, I think it's about asking the question who is excluding you? And this, I think, explains much. When a minority group is excluded, we tend to treat that exclusion more tolerantly than when the majority, the hegemony, is excluding from its ranks minority or minority members. Uh, and that's why if a Catholic school is excluding, it's a non-issue. In France, who is excluding? It is the hegemonic state that is trying to exclude the Muslim minority, and this is conceived to be, at least generally, at least bluntly, because of the context of who is excluding who, we tend to see that as being intolerant. But if a minority is excluded, then this is something that we treat more in a more tolerant way. And this is how you also explain the case of Emmanuel. It was the hegemonic Ashkenazi group that was excluding. In Ashkenazi yeshivo, there is a quota system until this present day. Only 20% of an Ashkenazi Lita'i yeshiva can be Sfaradi. It's like Harvard in the 1920s in terms of, of Jews. And you would mm -hmm. find Sfaradi school students fighting to get into these yeshivas. But it is this this, this relationship of having a hegemonic, having this more powerful group which is more aligned with the minority that is excluding, and that's why Emmanuel, at least in terms of the result, can be justified. But if so, it is once again justified only when we look at the groups that are involved, irrespective of the individual liberal outlook. Because when we look at these two cases from that perspective, as the court did, it does not make any sense. Thank you. We'll move on to the next talk. Thank you very much and for keeping time. Uh, we're going to hear now from Dr. Carl Kidron, a senior lecturer at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Haifa, the only Department of Anthropology in Israel. <laughs> uh, Kidron has undertaken comparative ethnographic work with Holocaust descendants in Israel and children of Cambodian genocide survivors in Cambodia and Canada. Uh, her work has also considered the way in which Jewish and Buddhist paradigms of memory differentiately frame the lived experience of remembering and forgetting. We'll hear more about that in a minute. 
she's published extensively in American Ethnologist, Current Anthropology, uh, and that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> and Annals of Tourism Research, which is a really cool journal, by the way. And uh, I'll, I'll do it, okay? And uh, we'll move on to your talk, and I'll okay. switch to the PowerPoint. Excellent. Um, thank you very much to the organizers for this very fascinating workshop. I'm, every time there's an interdisciplinary dialogue, I, it forces me to redefine my terms in a way that can be easily translated into other terms. And also following all your conversations has been a challenge and, and really interesting. So I uh, hope my work benefits from this in the future, and my students, obviously, so that I can create a better dialogue with other materials. Okay, so I was very tempted um, to move just to the end of my talk, assuming that everyone had a chance to read, which is, a, in a way, a kind of selfish thing to do. Um, but I will summarize. So, um, what I'd like to start with is just a basic understanding of anthropological perspectives of how we discuss framing and cultural framing. So what I'd like to say is my question would be in what ways has Western European discourse, and I include therapeutic discourse, legal discourse, and as well, discourse on collective memory and forgetting in the Euro-West created a frame that is in friction with frames in countries, basically, I would say, most profoundly third, fourth world countries, where they have different concepts of therapy, different concepts of memory, forgetting, and healing, suffering, and the suffering self. And if I want you know, to extend that, I could go as far as time and history. Um, although anthropology itself is critical of perspectives that essentialize cultural difference, I would like to ask you to consider with me that there are key differences in the way people experience suffering, loss, and conflict that may require of us to be self-critical of our frames. So I began my career with studying Israeli second-generation Holocaust survivors. And it was an autoethnography in the sense that I was critiquing the profile of second-generation survivors in the literature, claiming that they were not necessarily perceiving themselves as suffering from transmitted PTSD. And most certainly, many of them did not want to be carriers of memory for the Israeli nation or for their families, and that they didn't perceive their parents as, as especially wounded, or at least they perceived their parents as resilient. And most powerfully, I wanted to claim that they, their silence in the home was not a marker of trauma, but actually an alternative form of presence and commemoration. And having done that, and insisting that they had not been silenced, but they, had been si they were silencing themselves out of choice, I decided to go to other cultures to try to see how silence could be perhaps misinterpreted as silencing. And there might be a choice to forget, or at least to move on, rather than to commemorate, rather than to obsess over the past, and to create a future in the image of certain mistakes done in the past, but not necessarily to commemorate um, every aspect of human suffering. Not only that, but my question was, when Western humanitarian intervention arrives in these countries, how it, do they perceive their way of beings? Are they able to interpret their their cultural frames as other? Or do they assume concepts such as justice, suffering, uh, illness, and wellness are either similar to our own or can be pedagogically reframed, transformed into something similar to our own because ours, I will say very bluntly, is better and more therapeutic. 
Um, and perhaps, and I want to say, yes, critically, you've, I hope many of you have read my work, that for um, uh, many people who are active in humanitarian aid and intervention, their perspective is that for uh, people around the world, even if they do not understand these new perspectives, pedagogy around memory will eventually lead to some sort of emotional redemption. And as well, our concerns for political order in the world require of us to help others perceive our way of creating reconciliation because conflict will create destability for them as well and not only for us. So when I arrived in Canada first, I'm running out of time, right? I'm talking too slow. Um, when I arrived in Canada first, uh, I found that Canadian diaspora Cambodians were telling me that they had chosen to reconcile with the past and forget, and they were unwilling to commemorate and unwilling to consider the tribunal in Cambodia as something valid and important for their future. They insisted that in the Cambodian perspective, any representation of evil and of suffering would do nothing but create vengeance for the future, create new forms of conflict, and also force the new generation to constantly look backwards rather than to create a future that was free of conflict. In other words, they rejected the concept of Euro-Western pedagogy through memory. And I had to ask myself, how do they define the term reconciliation? Because for them, reconciliation was to release the past, to reconcile with what had happened, not to forget, but in our terms, to forget in the sense that it would not have to be present in the form of signs of suffering. That means no testimony in the public sphere, and that means no museology in every corner representing atrocity. And that would also mean, in terms of therapy, therapy could help you resist rumination, but not ask you to work through which is again a very subtle difference in terms of our, what Fassan would call universal semiotics of suffering. Their semiotics are extremely different because of core differences in senses of self, memory, forgetting, time again, and history. So when I arrived in Cambodia, I discovered, and I see there's probably very little time to show you pictures. So um, when I arrived in Cambodia, I found that humanitarian intervention and memory brokers, psychiatrists, and museologists, many of them Jewish, Jewish Americans and Jewish Israelis, had gotten there before me <laughs> and didn't ask people questions on rec about reconciliation and justice. So as you know, there is a hybrid tribunal in Cambodia where people are being taught to give testimony. And it is hybrid on the surface. It is culturally competent, because there are Cambodian judges alongside um, uh, um, uh, foreign judges. Uh, not only that, the uh, people, the, te the survivors on the stand are, are um, um, what, do you, what do you say like when you say when you like with the Bible. They swear. Yeah, they swear on the spirits of the earth and not on a Christian Bible, Jewish Tanakh. Or, um, they have a monk sitting there to help them get through the emotional experience. So that's the tribunal. I hope to get back to it at the end. Besides the tribunal, there's the transcultural psychological organization founded by Holland but now independent, with psychiatrists doing trauma therapy, therapy that is called testimony therapy, which I will get to in one second. And the third most important um, piece of this puzzle is DC CAM, which is the, which is the Cambodian Yad Vashem, 
that ha is collecting testimonies, archival um, evidence of the genocide, but most importantly, it, alongside the Cambodian government, has set up 84 monuments throughout the country, besides the two major sites, which is the Killing Fields and S21, the prison uh, in Phnom Penh. It has set up 84 monuments and is about to set up 24 new ones, monuments which I will show you look like this, which again, on the surface, look very culturally competent. In other words, the form is Cambodian Buddhist. It is the shape. I will show you in a second. Okay, I don't have it. That's too bad. Okay, it is the shape of a monument. Just go back to that. That's fine. This stupa is the shape of a monument. Similar, it's, it's a, a, a mimicked image of the small monuments Cambodian families use to contain the ashes of cremated family members. But if you look closer, you can see that inside this stupa are human remains, which, as far as cultural uh, competency is concerned, it is taboo. Cambodians believe that these spirits have not been, these individuals have not been, you know, well, these individuals have not been um, cremated. Their spirits cannot move on to their next incarnation or to um, samsara. And in a sense, they are in limbo, liminal, and can't possibly find any peace. Not only that, they are considered dangerous spirits, having had experienced this bad death. So I just want to say a few words in the time that I have about testimony therapy, which I think represents what I consider the problematics of universal, universalism in terms of how it is imposed in a way that's absolutely contradictory to um, local cultures. So testimony therapy, the, psych the Transcultural Psychological Organization, TPO, alongside DC CAM, has organized um, these ceremonies in which survivors are taken to the killing fields, to a place where they believe their bad spirits are present of the dead who have not been cremated. Um, and then they are asked to read their testimonies in public in a very emotional and difficult experience for a Cambodian who never speaks about the difficult past. In terms of their ethnopsychology, for those of you who have read, you know this, their concept of forgetting is based on the fact that they feel that too much thinking, which they call kutran, is actually the cause of illness and not a form of healing. So in other words, what we call rumination, to think about the past in order to work through it, once you are guided by a therapist who helps you do this, they feel that this is the cause of illness. And they believe that meditation is the only way to help them avoid thinking about the past. And that is the source of their health and their resilience. So when you look at this, thera this trauma therapy, which has de been designed by these two NGOs, and I hope I have a minute at the end to discuss what this means, who has designed these culturally incompetent therapies. So after they read their testimonies, they go into the pagoda where they read them again, and the monk takes their um, testimony pages and releases them of their story. So on the surface, I would like to point out that this hybrid form, just like the hybrid tribunal, appears on the surface to be attempting to be culturally competent. This is a way in which two frames are meeting, and perhaps near in terms of Rorty, you have an overlap, and there is a way of a kind of new familiarity with something that is other and being reinterpreted in a way that we can live with this, perhaps they can as Cambodians. But if you ask yourself, what is happening to these individuals at the end of the trauma testimony when this is the first time they have ever spoken about their experience and who has been listening beyond the monk? So the two people that are guiding with them through this 
our TPO or Transcultural Psychiatry Organization workers, resource workers, and DC CAM staff, in other words, their Yad Vashem staff. They've been trained for three months to do, kill two birds with one stone, to get as many testimonies they can from villagers who have never spoken in public or in their families about, these, about their, their genocide experiences, and also to do psychological uh, testing, three months of training. And then these stories serve two NGOs. They go into the archives, they go on websites to show that Cambodia is moving into the 21st century and becoming acquainted with working through, and they will be a reconciled, rehabilitated country in the global community. And TPO, in my interviews with psychiatrists at TPO, I hate to be cynical, and I don't want to be very pessimistic, but when I interview the psychiatrist at TPO, they say two things. First, I ask them, why are you, I understand why you have to explain what the experience of a broken Cambodian mind, which is the word bakspat, which was not in my, my, my talk. Bakspat means that the individual, after suffering, has no courage, their mind is broken. But broken mind in Cambodian cultural conceptions is not trauma, it is not PTSD. It's someone who has been disempowered by, by hundreds and hundreds of years of occupation and hundreds and hundreds of years of silence by various forms of hegemony. So when I ask the, the, the TPO psychiatrist, I understand that you are telling European and American psychiatrists that these people have bakspat, but why are you telling Cambodians that they may have trauma and they need trauma therapy? And why are you doing these forms of trauma therapy that is forcing them in many ways to take on forms of speech and voice that is foreign to them. And his answer was, trauma is good for conferences. <laughs> now, before we, we critique him, and I'll end with this, the reality, and this is the same for transitional justice, and I hope someone asks me more about the tribunal, <laughs> The reality of Cambodia and many post-conflict third world countries is that the only way to get aid, the only way to get funding as a local NGO is to show acceptance, familiarity with these frames. And they are not translated into culturally competent forms of healing or justice. But if you ask the Cambodians, and this is the bottom line that is ethically most problematic, they will say that this is the only show in town, and if, the, if, if they have to choose between failed translation and no food and no school next to the monument, because the NGO is paying for a school next to the monument. They say, we prefer failed translation, and if we have to, there's no problem. When we feel badly, we walk past the monument. We don't look at the skulls. They are, they are meaningless to us. We walk to the pagoda, but we also have a school. So the ethical question is, I can come and critique humanitarian intervention and aid and memory workers who don't have funding, perhaps, to learn more about cultural competency. And the Cambodians may not, in fact, be explaining themselves because they want that school. So that as an anthropologist, I have to ask myself, I can be obsessed over cultural translation, but the final sentence for me is, what do they want as hybrid people entering the global community? And not my theoretical critique of cultural frames and their various frictions. So, and here. Okay, uh, we have uh, just 15 minutes for a brief discussion. So, please. Um, I, this question goes to you. I, I was wondering if you would interview the people who gave the testimonies and went through the
process? What is their experience? Should I answer? Or no, let's pick correct? a few questions. Yeah. So I think you know the two talks fit wonderfully together because both of you, the way I, I hear you, lead us back to Mir's lecture today in the morning. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea or the notion that um, we shouldn't try to get to some kind of physical notion of justice and work from that notion down, but rather you know, look at very specific case studies and try to figure out you know, in what ways they yield you know, notions, not necessarily of justice, perhaps more of decency, Amir, and, and then try to see if there's a way to combine them. Uh, globally, I think both of you bring the global dimension into the conversation, which we didn't have in last part. Um, I think that there's, uh, I'll start with Mikhail's talk, which is that what you showed is sort of the great contradiction between substantive liberalism and procedural liberalism. In other words, that you can have a liberalism which says that we have the same rules and we apply the same rules to everybody and we don't care what paradoxes that sets up and would sell up lots of paradoxes in different cases. Or you can say that liberalism is a cause with content and with a given culture and that we want people to adopt the liberal culture. These are not the same. And because they're not the same, that people will always be caught in these contradictions. This is very similar to your problem, because your problem is that the people come in, and whether or not they want to, the uh, age workers and the psychiatrists and all of these think that they are arguing in the name of universal norms, some kind of universal human nature which needs therapy and has traumas, and that every society, even if you were in Mongolia, you'd have trauma and need therapies. And the problem is that they're not able to think that some particulars do not fit those universal norms. So that the universal norms become grotesque when they're dealing with the particulars. That's exactly the same situation, that, that you're dealing with forms of grotesqueness in the end. Uh, Gabriel just asked <laughs> Also, to me, I really enjoyed this paper. I thought it was a uh, fascinating read. Um, but you, you, the ultra orthodox, after all, are also a minority, right? Uh, they're certainly treated as a minority by by the majority secular, traditional, you know, uh, religious Zionist aspect of the vast majority of Jewish Israelis, right? Uh, so if you if your terms of analysis are majority and minority, then that obfuscates the fact. Or maybe I'm asking, right? Doesn't it obfuscate the fact that in fact the ultra orthodox are very much treated as a minority, see themselves as a minority, are represented as a minority in in, in public discourse? So the distinction seems to be it seems to me when I look at these very interesting contra punctual uh, study of yours, it seems to me that the major distinction between the two cases is, again, uh, sorry to be re returning to my own thing earlier, but it seems to me between those who are within the us who we care about and therefore apply uh, liberal, we see them as individuals with complex lives and stories and apply uh, 
uh, uh, liberal standards to them, Jews, and others who can protect their exotic otherness and let's keep them as exotic others. They can preserve their culture. We'll centralize it. We'll make them into an organic community uh, and keep them outside of the circle of liberal jurisprudence. See what I'm saying? And this is, in a way, this aspect of the mouse is the only thing that I, I, I was sort of missing from what is this very, very solid argument. Mm -hmm. So Orthodox community is not a minority. It does not fit to any a profile of minority. It's overrepresented in government. It's overfunded. It has a power in politics that no other minority either has. It's imposing its views on the Jewish majority when it comes to our army service and so on. This is not a minority. Cultural minority. Well, I don't think it's a cultural minor. Who's threatening the Hanfa Hanfa? They're expanding all over the place. <laughs> They're taking on, if al I think in, in 10 years would be ultra-Orthodox. Give uh, al-Shahul is already. Rechavia. This is not a minority. This is a very powerful group which does not fit to any, I think, profile of, of, of a minority. So I, I, I kind of dispute the claim that the ultra-orthodox is, is a minority. And I don't agree in terms of the us and the you. First of all, I mean, the Mayana Hinuka Turani has been existing. And it was not conceived of splitting us, the Jews. Right? But then it existed. How, how do you explain that? When, when, when the Sfaradi wanted to break out and be independent, that, that was taken to be very legitimate. And it still is very legitimate. But when the Ashkenazi is excluding, that is conceived to be not. And this is explained by what I'm offering. When a minority is doing the excluding and wanting to exclude itself. If the blacks in the U.S. would want to have their own schools and not admit whites, that is different from when the whites are excluding blacks. Even though the act is of exclusion, is, is just the same. I mean, look, look at the Native Americans. Well, why can't the Native Americans exclude? But if they are excluded, then that is treated different. Today, or that example wouldn't hold. I don't think maybe the Americans would correct me. But I don't no, think a black no, school sorry. today. Uh, sorry. No, we, we, he, he barely has time no, to no, answer. I, mean, I think I, I can go into the, 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 the Martinez case. The, there's a lot of cases in, 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 where, in where the Native American community is protected from the equal treatment uh, as it is prescribed by the U.S. Constitution. It is granted sovereignty and immunity. And, it, and, and it, it's, it, I think it can only be explained on that being an um, underpowered okay, minority, which I don't think is. Well, the procedure on the substantive issue, right? Well, if, if, if it's, let's take the procedural, if, are, are the same standards applied in terms of Mona Jabarin and, uh, and the Madura? No. I mean, the Catholics can exclude as much as they can, but the Ashkenazis cannot. How do you explain that? How can you explain that? I, I can't explain it, neither by substantive nor by the procedural liberalism. And look how the circles are drawn. When you look at the Emmanuel case in, in following decisions, because it was not enforced, the Ashkenazi section didn't want to admit still the Sparadi. Contempt petitions were filed one after the other, and the Supreme Court was saying, us, the Jews, I mean, we, we are one. But when you look at the Arabs, you can be as different as you like, okay? Uh, that, that, is, that is the claim, that is the narrative. But there's another thing that should be also supplementing. The Arab community is not against what the Catholics are doing. You had all the Knesset members just three or four months ago standing by 
these Christian schools are. I mean, they should have funding and they should have autonomy. The case is, is, is more puzzling in the sense that it's not as, as, as it would seem, neither substantively nor procedurally. It can only be, I think, explained by these circles with edges that exclude and include. In terms of my personal, I, I have a big dilemma. Uh, because, you know, uh, for me, excluding uh, this Muslim pupil, at least if I was the one who was running the school, I, I would be opposing that, that, that argument. But then, would that be justified in terms of these norms that happen to be applied? I mean, you, you can oppose what the Native Americans are, are doing in terms of not treating their women equally, but you can be for, at least you can justify why they should have sovereignty over the territory. And, and it's, it's not the personal thing that I was motivated by, but I think it was more the, 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 the ability to see reality through the lens of the group and a group right conception. And I don't differentiate between individual and group rights because if anything has been offered by multiculturalism, like the writings of was thinking of, he does make it possible to argue for group rights from a liberal perspective. And for people who happen to be within these communities, they would be arguing that my individuality is embedded in this group identity. So protecting the group is not really protecting the group per se, also protecting it, but primarily protecting my own individual uh, cultural identity, which, which is something that is also uh, important for people. So it, it's, I kind of picked up some of the discussion. I think there is not a very clear line or border between individuals and communities, but Nonetheless, I think it's equally important that there is some type of realities that we cannot just see through the prism of liberalism and the individual. Group interactions, who is the group that is excluding? Who is the group that is wanting the autonomy? Who is pushing for separation? It does make a difference. Mona Jabari, if Mona Jabari was applying to Bar Ilan University, which is a Jewish religious university that also has a Jewish identity. From the perspective of what I was offering, the university would not have a standing saying. But if Yeshiva University in the US, representing something of the Jewish religious culture, is doing the exclusion, it's not like Georgetown is doing the exclusion. There's a difference of who is the group that is excluded. Is it identified more with the minority, or is it identified because with, with, with the majority? And I think that does make a difference. And I know very well that the American anti-discrimination law is not aligned very well with this theory. And I think it does it does offer some kind of an adjustment to that theory. I mean, affirmative action. Uh, let's take affirmative action, and I will end with this. You know, John Hart Ely uh, said, whenever there is discriminatory acts in the U.S., that there would be subject to scrutiny, to, to strict scrutiny, right? But he said affirmative action is different because it is the majority that is excluding its members from admission, from jobs, and when this happens, it's not suspect of being discriminatory because I, the majority, is doing something wrong for my own members. It would be suspect and it would, should be subject when the majority is excluding minorities. And that's how he refines yeah. his argument. And I think it would refine just the same the anti-discrimination norms in the US, which I acknowledge are not well aligned with, with what I've said. Thank you. You won't? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, I apologize. Okay. Okay. Yeah, Nabi is in the room, so it's <laughs> <laughs> <To> What? <laughs> okay.
Cal, you have okay, I have four, four and a half minutes. Now. No, no, I have five. I have five. <laughs> yeah. No, right. I'll have, have a conversation afterwards if, if they won't let you. And now you have four and a half no, minutes. No, <laughs> pressure me, Adam. We go back. Uh, okay, so um, now I'm going to be even more pessimistic to answer your questions because the questions require an honest answer in terms of my data. Um, when speaking to people who gave testimony and who gave testimony at the tribunal, not only at trauma therapy, their answer was that they went there thinking, expecting that they would see uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, request forgiveness, request re-entry into village life, they've been living on the borders, or they're hiding in the government, they're government officials who received amnesty. So, on the one hand, they're telling me, we don't expect the government not to be corrupt. This country is made up of Khmer Rouge, who received amnesty, and who are our leaders now, and who have gotten rich and powerful, and we have no control. And then they say, well, we know that eventually they will, ha they will be punished. Their karma has been affected, and the tribunal will not punish them. So, if they could give us a traditional form of, like we see in uh, the GACCA, GACCA is yeah. that the trial? But they would never do that because half of our village is full of Khmer Rouge as well. We all know we live together and there's no, there's no way to create the kind of reconciliation we imagine in our imaginary. So they don't expect that this system or this form of justice could possibly work, not in their political context, and absolutely not in their sense of what Buddhist forgiveness is about. They also don't think of themselves as having, and this is partially an answer to Amir's question as well, that they perceive themselves as, as the individual has no self that has individual rights. So in other words, whose rights would this system be protecting? So everyone is dealing with their own fate. They have obligations to their family members to receive merit from them, to give them merit, to cremate their dead, to remember them their dead and to make them present in a very traditional format that has nothing to do, and I emphasize this, with the history of genocide. The way someone is killed or dies of illness is irrelevant to the way in which families remember them and interact with them. Again, the past is not relevant for familial relations. Again, how different from psychology and also from the law in terms of evidence and going back and checking you know, the context in which an event occurred. Not relevant to them. And now the ugly part of this is that they said they went there because they heard that there are reparations. And when they didn't get reparations, they go home and they say, now I'm sick from too much thinking. And no one helps me. So I get no money, and I'm sick, and I know that this person has his own karma. So I think, to answer Amir's question, if you ask me cynically, and this is what I write in my articles, that these kind of performances are moral pl playgrounds for us. And you can't tell them not to build this moral playground because that's where the money is. And not only that, if I want to be optimistic in some way in terms of what cosmopolitan memory is, they know that if they want to become global citizens, this is not only theory, this is practice. And they come from a disempowered, position, subaltern, and they say, 40% of Cambodia is illiterate. You know, they look at me as God, and, and they say, why are you asking me questions? I want you to tell me what to do. Is this monument good? And then how do I do an interview to someone, with someone who says to me, you know, I don't. It's a, from, in my theoretical terms of politics of identity, they're saying, you're the he hegemon, tell me what to do. But when I insist, and this is the, my final hope, that hybridity will not create kind of these shatnez grotesque solutions, because I agree with you and I call it shatnez, which is a hybrid that has failed. These are failed hybridities. 
And when I ask them bottom line, because many of them spend one hour in an interview in a cafe saying to me, these monuments are wonderful, and these monuments you know, will teach my children all about the genocide because they don't know, and it's very important, and I'm so glad that TPO is helping us and teaching us that the reason why we don't sleep at night is not because we're poor, but because we have PTSD. <laughs> and, and then I say, okay, okay, and I'm writing it down because they're all telling me the same thing and smiling and getting lunch from me, right? And then I ask at the end, when you have to, you know, venerate your dead, do you go to that monument in your village? Because they dug up their grandparents and put them in those monuments. They is the United Nations and Cambodians who have gotten rich from those exhumations. And I can't critique them either. And I ask, do you go there to venerate? And they laugh. And I have to ask three times, and they say no. And then I get the answers. It's a dangerous place. Who would want to go there? Who would want to see that? Bad death. I will be cursed. I will become ill. And also, I don't know if my ancestors are there. But in my private stupa monument, where I have the ashes of some of my relatives, that's where they will come to get food and incense. Not at that strange, grotesque place, and I will not take my children there. So now the hard question is, like our trips to Poland, they are now taking children in schools to these monuments. And many American anthropologists, and I apologize that I emphasize American, and I can tell you in the break why I just said that. So they there's are- no There's no break. There's no break. <laughs> so they are, uh, they are, they are, they are having public official ceremonies organized by the government, bringing school kids to the monuments to look at the skulls, which they should not be looking at, and filming it and putting it on the internet and sending it to the NGOs. And then the anthropologists are going and saying, Carol, you're all wrong. They're learning about the genocide. They want to see those places. They're learning. It's, we're ending the silence. And this is about us. It's about us. And if I ask the Cambodian, why did you go to that ceremony? They tell me, because the village head told me to go. And because there was food there. On this happy note. <laughs>